S D Boyan. So I, I'm not going to ask you for another prediction here, but I'm interested. Like, was your was that prediction that you made just based on overall fundamentals in silver, or did your PSLV follow-on offering play like way heavily on that prediction? Not really. Um, like, I didn't think it would go to 50 because we were doing this issue. Although I was very pleased with uh, the size of that issue, it was a very successful uh, offering. Um, one of the interesting things about these uh, the, the IPO of the uh, the Silver Trust, I think we raised 550 million. We, when we did our IPO of the Gold Trust, we raised 440 million. And recently, when we did our latest Silver Tranche, we raised 350. When we did the latest Gold Tranche so far, and it's still in distribution, by the way, so I can't really speak much about it. Uh, but it's um, it's raised. Uh, I think it was 303 million. Uh, before exercise of the green shoe, which has not been exercised yet. But the, the point I always like to make, that uh, people buying this are, are making up their own minds, and they're willing to put as much money into silver as into gold, which means they're buying 50 times more physical volume of silver than they are gold. And when you go to the U.S. Mint site, they sell the same number of dollars of silver as gold, which means people are buying... 50 times more silver than gold. But when you look at what's available to buy, you know, we produce 80 million ounces of gold a year and maybe 70 million of that is available for investment. And we produce 900 million ounces of silver and theoretically, let's say 200 million is available for investment. Well, that means you can only buy three times more silver than gold for investment purposes. But we see so many instances where the ratio is 50 to 1. And, I, and gold, gold money is the same thing. Almost every time I talk to a, a, a metals dealer, I have the favorite question, how much silver do you sell versus, versus gold? And every time I get the same answer, we sell as many dollars of silver as gold. Well, that's impossible. You know, it's just impossible that people can keep buying at that rate and we not end up with some kind of shortage. So that's really... It's those data points that uh, make me so optimistic about silver. Yeah, I mean, the shorts can continue at throwing on paper, adding on paper up to a point, but when the actual physical data indicates one-to-one -one flows into gold and silver, like you said, they just can't continue forever. Right. And, you know, one of the other things that's happening recently that I've kind of noticed, uh, Harvey Organ has a wonderful website where he shows the, uh, the flows of metal in and out of the COMEX, and I am absolutely stunned at the amount of silver that is um, uh, asked for delivery every month now, and every day almost. Normally, you know, you see uh, when, when they're expiring, a, a lot of people settle for cash, but man, these people just keep piling in there and taking the silver. So that is, is a, a, quite a dramatic change from where I would think it was six months ago, that almost every day now, you can sometimes find in the expiring month, like this month, the open interest goes up. Uh, which means, you know, some guys coming in there to get physical delivery. So I think that uh, it's it's certainly taking hold here. We've had a pretty good rally in the price of silver since year end. It's probably due for a little bit of a, a pause here. I don't want to say a correction, but we are so close to breaking out of the big downtrend in uh, in gold that um, uh, sorry in silver that there could be a lot of fireworks here uh, with, with all the demand we're seeing. And I think that your fund obviously could play into that a little bit. As most of our listeners are aware, your fund, the, the Sprott Physical Silver Trust, announced another additional 200, was it 250 to 350 million follow-on offering in January? Yeah, we raised 350. We raised 350 million, or 349, something like that. And it's just amazing. Yeah, um, and, you, and by the way, I should tell you that we didn't have any trouble buying the silver. In the first issue, we had trouble buying the silver, and it took a long time to get delivery. Uh, I'm sort of disappointed that the delivery was as easy as it was, by the way. One of my aims in life is to to do a silver issue and find out that I can't buy the last bar. <laughs> um, that hasn't happened yet, but I'm 
you know, if, if, if people keep up their interest in silver like they are, I have no doubt that uh, that could happen. And I, one of the um, stunning developments in gold is that the Chinese seem to be buying a lot of gold these days, and I sort of wonder who's buying it. I suspect it might be the uh, People's Bank of China. And um, I'm going to do a little work on um, trying to see if I can find out what kind of silver might be going over to China. But there's a, there's a huge appetite for precious metals in in China and in India, and, and the trends just, you know, you keep reading these double-digit trends of increases in demand, whether it's even industrial or investment, and how can you have double-digit increases in physical demand when the, when the amount of silver available every year goes up 3 to 5 percent? I mean, it's just, it's an impossibility. Right. Yeah, and that's quite a lofty goal you have there of <laughs> trying to uh, have a day that you aren't able to have delivery right. of your last bar. You still well, got. I, I think I think all your readers are hoping that too. So <laughs> we're all on the same page that way. I'm sure they are, but yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, you definitely answered that question because I was I was wanting to ask you about uh, your sourcing of the silver this time. If you had again seen any delivery delays like you had last time. I don't think we've had any. I, I don't know that we've got everything yet, but but you know, silver is kind of bulky, so it's not that easy to move around. So, you know, you can sometimes expect it can take three to four weeks to get the kind of size that we deliver. But, you know, last time there was some silver that was actually manufactured after the date that we'd committed to buy it. So, in my mind, it wasn't as though it was just sitting around in some inventory somewhere, and you know, you just you know, load up a truck and ship it. So there was a there was a. I think a bit of a shortfall at the time. Right. But I mean, I believe you're approved for, by the SEC for 1.5 billion additional, so you'll have a little, you'll have some more chances. Well, if, if the right, I mean, the one thing I, I really would like to do is get some institutions interested in silver. You know, I mean, lots of institutions, we can name the names, you know, about billions of dollars worth of gold. And, you know, if we could get some institutions that would uh, would see the reason why silver should outperform gold, and you know, get them to take down part of the PSLV offering, that's really what I what I'm hoping to do. And it's a bit of a struggle. You know, it's even a struggle. For example, I've been down to see um, pension fund advisors and trying to convince them that they should finally recommend precious metals for uh, for pension funds. And uh, it's a battle. I mean, we we haven't won them all over yet. So, but I mean, the minute we do, we all know that you know there's only about one percent of all the assets and the financial assets in the world are invested in precious metals, and that obviously can go a lot higher. Um, there's been some studies put out that suggest that uh, even low risk portfolios should have a two to three percent weighting in precious metals. So, if the pension guys would ever come through, it could be quite exciting for all the metals. Yeah, I definitely agree. I want to kind of go back and touch on one thing that I thought um, was pretty interesting, and from what I've read, you've had decent response to. Prior to this most recent follow-on offering of the PSLV, Eric, you sent a, a letter to numerous silver mining companies requesting that they keep their savings in physical silver rather than like paper assets such as, say, cash or treasuries. Mm -hmm. um, at the time, in the back of my mind, I kind of wondered whether you were preparing to begin sourcing physical silver, like in volume, directly from these mines. And that, that kind of speaks to me that the paper's futures market, such as the COMEX, is kind of in danger of being more fading into irrelevance rather than facing like a outright hard default. Um, so I guess, would you agree? Were those kinds of the reasons that um, you sent that letter, or what prompted well, the letter? Sure. Well... You know, I, I think we have a bit of a voice in the silver market, and, um, and the reasons that the letter was prompted is just the, the simple analysis that the paper traders were determining the price. And why should you, physical silver producers, let that happen? And most miners are not students of silver or gold, unfortunately. They're not. There's the odd CEO who's totally into understanding what, what the true value of precious metals is. But they seem to be few and far between because most of them are interested in tons and grades and recoveries and things like that, and they haven't been students of, the, of their own product. <clears throat> and so that was the, the primary thing. You know, would you guys please think about what's happening in your silver market, plus the fact that it got bombed last year, and, you know, you're just going to sit back and lose, you know, 25 bucks an ounce you might otherwise be making, or are you ready to take a stand here? 
The other, the easy, the very easy argument for me <clears throat> is when you have your money in a bank, you get no return. You essentially have no return. In fact, I think it was expressed uh, very well by the, the gentleman who runs UC Resources that uh, you know you actually get a negative return at the end of the year because inflation is higher than the return you're getting on your money. I happen to be of the view that uh, having money in a bank is a dangerous thing. And of course, they keep, um, in essence, bailing out the banks all the time, such as you know the recent G6 announcement that will give un unlimited loans to banks. Well, they had to give unlimited loans to banks because there were some banks that were on the brink, which, which tells you that it's, that it's risky having money in a bank. So not only do you have to accept the risk, you get a negative return, why don't you believe in your own product that, that also has been a currency and will, will become a currency? So that's really why I went there. And I thought, you know, if we could just tip a few of these silver producers around to thinking about, you know, what's going on in the markets and who's determining the price, maybe we'll let the physical markets determine the price instead of the paper markets determine the price. Yeah, that's all the world of difference. If you actually had physical market determining the price, the whole game would be over. Right, right. And I should tell you, as a follow-up to that, we've had some good response. Like, I was sort of shocked that out of nowhere UC Resources said they bought a million and a half dollars of this Silver Trust because I had not specifically spoken to them about it. But I can tell you that First Majestic did buy $10 million of our issue. And, you know, Keith Newmar, who runs First Majestic, is a very pro-silver guy. As you know, he makes silver available on his website, First Majestic Coins. And um, he was very helpful in that regard. And I would also point out that um, Endeavor Silver at the end of last quarter, when they produced, uh, I think it was 1.2 million ounces, only sold 400,000. And why did, they only, why did they not sell the other 800,000? Because it, they thought and, and explained that, you know, this price is not appropriately priced at the end of the quarter. It was down around $27. And, and kudos to them. Here the price is now 33. They made 20% more than they might have otherwise made. And, um, you know, I'm glad to see people taking a stand that uh, the, the paper price shouldn't determine where, where you're selling things. So uh, we're building a little momentum there. Um, you know, I, I would hope that in time, and I have a lot of things to do here besides going to see each mining company, but uh, in, in due course, I hope we'll convince others to do the same thing. Yeah, I think you're well on, your, on the way to achieving that goal. Um, we hope so. All right, Ken, let's talk a little bit about the European debt crisis, Eric. Um, we're, de sure. we're definitely reaching a pivotal point here. Up to this point, it's been continual can kicking, and I've kind of coined and added to what, what um, Jim, Jim Sinclair always says is the QE to infinity and beyond. But it appears here for the first time Germany's kind of getting wet feet, and they're tired of bailing out Greece. Um, do you think it's actually possible we'll see a Greek default or do, we, do you see the Fed stepping up at the plate at the last minute? And... 